All right, friends and neighbors, it is time for us to start talking about some Linux networking and configuration files. And so the reason that we're uh, going to start talking about this is because we want to start working our way towards some much larger topics. And we're going to start with Linux networking. But before we get there, I want to talk about some of the architecture, some of the structure of the files that you're likely to see as you head down your networking journey. Okay, so first of all, why Linux networking? You can certainly make the case that you could live your life as a Windows networking kind of person. That is to say, most of the nodes you deal with are Windows nodes, we got Windows servers, and then you're gonna connect them with some kind of architecture, and that's true. And of course, uh, Windows supports containerization and virtual machines and all of that. All right, but, the Linux operating system is one of the most popular uh, out there in the world today. It gets used everywhere. So even a Windows shop will very commonly deploy Linux servers of one kind or another. Plus, for small devices, they're usually some kind of lightweight or lobotomized uh, Linux operating system. And then we've got quotes like the one I have here from CareerKarma.com. The most popular OS and 100% of supercomputers super use the Linux operating system. Okay, so there we go. There's lots and lots of reasons to study Linux. And certainly on this channel, a lot of the virtual machines uh, that I've built and some of the containers are also uh, Linux-based. So there we go. Lots, lots of reasons to study Linux. But why am I mentioning Config files. Well, certainly configuration files have been used everywhere. If you're an old Linux or, or Windows person or a Unix person, you might remember .ini files. Uh, and essentially, a configuration file is a file that gets read by something to tell it how to start up or how to begin processing things or where libraries are, where directories are. It can be just about anything. And they're very commonly easy for a human to read. But today we see a couple of formatting techniques that are sort of emerging. Now, one of them has been around maybe longer than the other ones, you could argue. Uh, and the big three that I'm talking about are XML, JSON, and YAML. Now, these are formats, and if you've read articles lately or you've been involved in configuration of any kind, you've probably come across these three formats, and they're all slightly different, and they're used for slightly different things. Now, if you've never heard of them before, there's no reason to panic. They are just different ways of organizing uh, data or information and then reading that information in from a file. And... By that, I mean this. Files are formatted in either XML or JSON or YAML, and then something else reads them in and processes it. So there are programs that are designed to read these particular formats. So there's a syntax, there's meaning, there are objects in each one of these, not unlike a programming language, uh, but it's just a way to organize data. So we'll talk just a little bit about all three of them. Now, the first one is the extensible markup language, or XML. That's from W3C. It's one of their recommendations out there. And you can certainly, I mean, they have a lot of recommendations. So I would encourage you to take a look at their site. I've got it there. So XML is a subset of the standard generalized markup language. Uh, and it, that can be found in ISO 8879. So that's the actual standard. But you can go out and read all these specifications right out at w3.org and then follow the links to, to read about whatever you want. Now, XML has a couple of goals associated with it. So when they were writing the XML specification, these were a couple of the big ideas, a couple of the important. Now, they're not all of them, but there are, these were a couple of the big ones, right? So shall support a wide variety of applications. So you use XML as a specification that's used to create other things. Now, most commonly, XML is used for documents. Well, YAML and JSON are most, most of the time, they're called data serialization techniques. They're used in association with data. Uh, and so that's a little bit different. So there's a distinction there. Now, another uh, goal of XML 
was it shall be easy to write programs which process XML documents. So again, you write a document in an XML format that gets read by something else to create the document that you want. So if you're going to deploy XML, the number of optional features is kept to an absolute minimum. So if your XML is XML is XML. Now when you're reading an XML document, it's reasonably clear what you're looking at. There are obviously the there's the syntax of XML itself, but the syntax is pretty easy to read, and then there are bodies of text that are going to be operated on. And then XML documents are easy to create. So I first came across XML sort of formatting when I was working with LaTeX or LaTeX to create documents. And so you would, you would create an XML document of some kind, or um, when I was working with Genie, you would have an XML specification of some kind, and you would import that and it would create a document. So here's a couple of examples of XML. And again, these are right off the uh, their site. You don't have to uh, write any of this stuff down. I encourage you to take a look at the w3schools.com. And so you can see that there's a couple of things here. One is that we've got these very clear syntax of the greater than or less than signs. And then there's this nested structure here. Now there's a couple of other things that when you start something, it looks like this, and then there's you've got to complete that. So you see each one of our layers here or levels has got a start and an end, and that's how you do it. And then there are some keywords or objects that we use when we're creating an XML document so that we can create some other document. So there you go. So there's uh, several objects here in this particular example. So again, XML is one of those things that's used with uh, documentation, but it is one of the three big ways that today we talk about organizing data so that we can create some other document. JavaScript object notation, or JSON, is another way to format a document so that you can create some other document, or in this case, we're usually talking more about data organization. So here's our definition, right? It's a lightweight data interchange format. So that is to say you create a JSON file or a JSON formatted file, and that gets read by something else to create some other, other kind of file or other kind of data stream. So it's easy for machines to parse and generate. And a little spoiler alert here, it's going to look very similar to XML, but the organization and the syntax is just going to use some different notation. So, as we can see, based on a subset of the JavaScript programming language standard that goes all the way back to 1999. Now, this is a common theme that all of these data serialization or markup languages have. So, we've got name value pairs, right? A lot of times you have a keyword or tricky phrase, and then you've got the, the value that it's pointing to. And so, those are tied together. And then you've got this collection of values that you're going to Put together in in the file so we've got this ordered list of values and if you're used to programming of course you you know that some data structures are ordered and some are unordered and they instead of the greater than less than now we're going to use the uh, the curly braces and the thing that separates the name value pair is the colon in the middle so here's a couple of examples right if you've seen a file that looks like this, right, you were looking at a JSON formatted file. So when I got started with software-defined networking, some of the early efforts to create configuration files for software-defined networking, particularly with some of the controllers, were in JSON formatted data. Now this is JSON on, the, on this side here, and the same data or the same details are organized in XML here. And so this is just a sort of a direct comparison between the two. And this is where these came from, right? JSON.org. So again, go out, take a look, and you get a better handle on this, and you'll see maybe some of the, the objects that you can create out there. Now, for the most part, you don't just sit down and say, well, I'm going to write something in XML. Well, some folks might, but uh, you don't normally say, I'm going to sit down and write something in XML, or I'm going to sit down and write a JSON file. Usually, you have some product that wants to receive 
a JSON or XML formatted document so that it can build something else. And the last one we'll talk about here is YAML. Now the fun part about YAML is it says YAML ain't a markup language. That's what it stands for. And you can go out to yaml.org and read a little bit about it. But it is the it is another way to organize data. Now it's not considered a markup language. It is considered a data serialization language for all programming languages. So the idea again is that you have a YAML formatted file and something takes that format in and the rules go like this. It's supposed to be human readable, right? So if you look at this example, you kind of know what's going on there and it is just this sort of hierarchically organized file with clear language for the objects, the name value pairs, there's the, the colon separation, and we can see that indentation. So it is a way to organize files. And so when you write a program that reads YAML formatted file, it should be fairly straightforward to create that program. And the YAML specification tells you what's allowed to be in a YAML formatted file. And this is just a little comparison between the three of them, right? So the again, the big three that we're talking about today are XML, JSON, and YAML. And this is just putting it all together, right? There's our XML formatted with its beginning and ending for each one of its topics. Here is the YAML formatted that we just saw. And then here is our curly brace formatted JSON files. You can do the exact same thing with all three of them, right? If you're trying to convey the same sort of information, uh, you could use any of these formats. But again, uh, JSON and YAML are typically going to be used for data, and XML is very commonly going to be used for documents of some kind. Why are we spending all this time talking about these specifications? Well, the answer is the network configuration for Linux. So here's a quote from the documentation from Ubuntu. Network configuration on Ubuntu is handled through NetPlan which provides high level distribution agnostic way to define how the network on your system should be set up via a YAML configuration file. You can create or edit a YAML configuration file and then have NetPlan read that file in to create your network configuration. Some understanding, particularly in the case of servers, of what format we're talking about and where the configuration comes from can be important. And this is just an example of all of the, this is some of the things that could go into a YAML formatted file that'll be read by NetPlan. Now, before we get too nutty here, let's just remember that we're talking about end nodes here and then maybe servers. With your end nodes, it's very common that you never have to do a network configuration at all, right? You plug in a network device to the network, DHCP is running, so it pulls all of its necessary configuration from the network. If it doesn't and you want to do a static configuration, then you would go into the GUI and, and set it up manually here, right? You would select IPv4 and do your manual configuration just like that. On the server side, though, when you're either not operating with a GUI or you want to have strict control over what your server is doing, and how its network connectivity is, is uh, being handled, you're going to be doing the, the configuration file instead. All right, let's take a quick look at some actual virtual machines that I have running. Right, So here is Oracle VirtualBox. I've got a whole bunch of VMs, and I'm going to pull up. First, we'll take a look at the Ubuntu desktop. Okay, so here is my virtual machine, and here is the... Oh, I have an artifact here. Uh, but here is the, the the GUI that you would use, right? Now, again, if I've got connectivity, I plug in or I connect to the wireless network and I'm golden. I don't have to do anything. But if I want to, I can go in here and select, you know, what I want to do for my configuration. And so that's, that's how you would do this on a, a workstation. Now, if you've got a server that's running a GUI, you might do this in the exact same way too, but sometimes servers have a much more complex configuration. So let's take a quick look at a server VM. 
All right, here is my server uh, VM. So let me sh I'll show you where I am, right? This is ETC net plan. And if I, if I take a look at what's in the directory, hopefully this font is large enough for you to see that. But I can see that I've got this YAML file here. And so if I say, there's only one of them, so we'll do it this way. Okay. So here is where the configuration file begins. Right, right here, and then we've got our YAML format. And now, all I did was the base install for the ISO. I haven't done anything with this VM. In future videos, we'll fool around with some of this stuff. But there we have it. That's what NetPlan is going to read for the configuration on this particular VM. Now, there is some stuff that we shouldn't forget about. Now, I have been uh, a networking from the command line for a long, long time. So I used to love my if up and if down and my if config and IW list and IW config and all of those. And you can install those tools. But today, what we probably ought to get used to is with, with IP. We ought to get used to uh, this particular command. And this example is how you would bring up a configuration for your interface maybe i'll show you that real quick uh, after i do this but right ipa so man ip is the, the it's going to give you the manual page and then we do ipa that'll show you your network configuration this is how we would add say an ip address or something like that this is how we bring it up and down this is as opposed to if up and if down and you can do route at i mean it's just a pile of things that you can do with this you can do a lot of configuration for a network interface but you may recall that the name server and the search order exists in etcresolve.config. Now, this is sometimes a file that we don't want to touch manually. If you've got some other process that's reaching out to touch it as well. So you just have to be aware of that. But that's where your, your DNS configuration lives. And this is just a quick example of you know, IPA here. So this is showing me my configuration, right? There's my loopback and there's this particular interface. And you can see that it's 10.0.2.15 right there. That's just because this virtual machine is sitting behind the NAT for the hypervisor. Well, there we go. That was getting started with Linux networking. And of course, what we talked about today was really configuration files and configuration file formats. And so if you spend any time in the world today with uh, Ansible or Kubernetes or Terraform, any of those, uh, if you spend time with software-defined network configs or server configs, you're going to be dealing with JSON formatted or YAML formatted files. And then, of course, you'll run into XML if you're dealing with, with documents. So don't panic if you see this thing. It's okay to manually edit them. Sometimes they're touched by other processes, so you just have to be aware of that. So going forward, you should absolutely get familiar with these three formats. Now, as far as the networking goes, right, whether it's net plan or how you do things from the command line, you know, the distros are going to be a little bit different, and even forks can be different. But we're going to be working through mostly Ubuntu, but we'll work through some other examples too. Well, hopefully that wasn't too boring for you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Like and subscribe if you're jazzed about Linux stuff, or even if you're not, uh, because we're going to be building on this as we, as we go. So whether your network configuration starts with JSON or YAML, may those packets always reach their destinations.